Okay, um, uh, thank you. I, I am grateful for uh, Michal Chapman who was willing to educate us about the, the story which we mentioned here and there during the, during the seminar on uh, approximation of groups. As you all know, the cons embedding problem which talks about approximation of von Neumann algebra was reputed uh, last recently and it will explain what is about and especially we want to hear why it's so far it has not been reputed also for group algebras namely why the hyperlinearity of groups which was mentioned this seminar is still an open problem Michael, thank you very much, and the stage is yours. <clears throat> thank you, Alex. Um, okay, so hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to talk at such a prestigious place, such as the IAS, even remotely. Um, so as Alex said, I'm just going to dive into it. Um, the talk is separated into four parts. Uh, I think the most interesting part is the last, so I, I'll try to not uh, uh, take too much time for the first parts. Okay, maybe I'll stop my share and reshare because it's a bit lagging. And hopefully this will be better. Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start by defining what is a game. So to define what a game is, I'm starting with the dramatization of what a game is. So uh, a, a game consists of the following uh, uh, stages. There is a referee. Uh, he's doing some sampling. He's conducting some sampling procedure. So maybe he tosses some coins, rolls some dice, and so on, and at the end, uh, he gets two questions. Uh, these questions are taken out of a finite set called the input set. This is this I here. So he sampled question X and question Y. He sent question X to one of the players called Alice and question Y to the other player called Bob. Alice and Bob, again, are doing their thing. They're, they are doing some process. And at the end, uh, they uh, output two answers. So again, this O is the set of possible outputs that Alice and Bob can answer with. And uh, Alice answered with a small a and Bob answered small b. And then the referee gets the answers. Now he has four things that he knows. He sent the questions x and y and he received the answers a and b. And he needs to analyze the results, whether this is a winning condition. So whether regarding the rules of the game, the players won or otherwise they lost. Great, so this was the, the dramatization. What is actually the data that we need to uh, define this game? So um, we need two finite sets, the input set and the output set. Uh, we need some question distribution. So we don't actually, so at some, uh, there are some cases that we do care about what is the actual procedure that the referee does, but for us, for this talk, the only thing we care is what, the what is the possible distribution of questions that uh, the referee sends to the, uh, to the players. And this is just mu, so this is a probability distribution over i cross i. And finally, we need to explain how the referee analyzes the results. So analyzing the result is just uh, some function from uh, pairs of answers and pairs, oh, sorry. From a pair of answers and a pair of questions, two, zero, and one. And when the, you, the referee just uh, puts in the function, the pair of answers and the pair of questions. And if the answer is one, he says that they won. And if the uh, uh, output is zero, he says that the players lost. So this quadruple of uh, data uh, is called a game. Great. 
now I didn't talk at all about the procedure that Alice and Bob conducts. Uh, so to explain what Alice and Bob are doing, uh, I need to talk about correlations. What is a correlation? A correlation is just a function from quadruples of uh, answers and questions uh, into the real numbers, satisfying the following condition. If you fix X and Y, so here I chose specific X and Y, and you look at the function only from O cross O to R, this is a probability distribution. Okay, so we think of P of A, B, X, Y. So if I write here P of A, B, X, Y, we think of it as a conditional distribution. Given that the questions X and Y were sent, what is the probability that Alice and Bob will answer with the answers A and B? Okay, and any uh, such function which satisfies that when you fix X and Y, this is a probability distribution, these functions are called correlations because this is the way Alice and Bob can correlate with one another. Now, usually uh, we don't care about the set of all possible correlations. This is too big of a set. We are, all, uh, we are only interested in subsets, in specific subsets of uh, the set of correlations. So I'll give three examples and these will be the three main examples in our talk um, in a moment, okay? So before I uh, give some examples of uh, correlation sets. If there is any question, please stop me because I'm a bit rushing forward. So uh, feel free to stop me. Anyway, uh, given a set, uh, a subset of correlations, I denoted by C subscript T, uh, we define the T value of the game in the following way. Okay, so we have a set of correlations. Uh, we want to define uh, some supremum over the set. So we take all the correlations from the set and we calculate the following sum for them. Uh, we take mu of x, y times p. Okay, so this goes, this sum goes for over all x and y's in i and all a and b's in o. So mu x, y is just what is the probability that the referee sends the questions x and y. I take the product with uh, P, A, B, X, Y. So this is the probability that the players will answer A and B given that they were asked X and Y. And I take the product with uh, the winning predicate evaluated at A, B, X, Y. So this is just a formula for the winning expectation of the players in the game given that they use the correlation P. Okay, so no matter what procedure they are doing, if the, uh, uh, the result of the procedure is a given correlation, this is the winning expectation in the game. And now I'm just asking what is the, pre, uh, the supremum over all possible correlations inside the subset C of T. Great, so these are values. Now I'll talk about three correlation sets and uh, the way we think about these sets is that they are somehow uh, models of uh, the physical uh, world. Okay, so when I talk about classical correlations, in some sense, that this is a, a, a model for the possible correlations inside a world governed by classical mechanics. Okay, so um, what are the classical correlations? To define them, I need first to define what are uh, the deterministic correlations. So for any uh, two functions, FA and FB from the question set into the output set, uh, I can define the following uh, uh, correlation. So P of this uh, data for A, B, X, Y, will be either a zero or a one, and it will be a one only if f a of x is a and f b of y is b, and this is otherwise. So how do we think, okay, so how is this related to actual players playing the game? This is exactly saying, okay, we don't play any funny things for any specific question that Alice is asked, she always answered the same answer. 
And for any question Bob is asked, he always answers the same answer and they are physically separated. So they don't hear their answer is not dependent on the question of the other player. And this is what they can do if they, for any question, just predetermine what answer they will give. Okay, so this is the deterministic correlations. And the classical correlations are just the convex hull of the deterministic ones. That, uh, maybe. Okay, so uh, how do we think what model this, like why did we take the convex hull? This is exactly because they can share a uh, randomness. Okay, so they can, before the game starts, uh, toss some coins and uh, decide that they use a specific uh, deterministic correlation for any uh, sequence of tosses that they, they see. Okay, so uh, this enables them to take also convex combinations of deterministic correlations. Great, so this is the first correlation set, the classical correlation set. Now I need to define what are the quantum correlation sets. Um, to that end, again, I need to uh, define these correlations. So um, it will take a bit of time. So uh, we take some n, so choose a natural number n. And for any question, uh, we need, so I, I will give now all the information needed to define a single quantum correlation. So for any x, we need two sequences of matrices. So um, this will be m, x, a, going all over a's and o, and n, x, a, going over all the n's, a's and o. Okay, so these are matrices, matrices of size n by n over the complex number, such that, Uh, all the maxs and naxs are positive operators. So they are uh, positive semi-definite matrices. Uh, and the sum of the maxs going over all the a's is equal to the sum of the NAX, nxas going all over o which is equal to the identity matrix of size n by n. So it's clear that th this seems very similar to a probability distribution. What is a probability distribution? It's just uh, a sequence of non-negative numbers that sum up to one. So here we have a sequence of non-negative matrices that sum up to the identity. So this is a non-commutative generalization of the notion of a probability distribution. This is called usually a projective operator valued measure. So projective operator value measures uh, is what we have here. Um, and we need an additional uh, uh, thing. We need a unit vector, psi, inside the tensor product of C to the N with C to the N. So this is a unit vector. Now, if we have all this information, we can define uh, a, a correlation. In the following way, we define a p of a b given x y is equal to the inner product between psi and the image of psi when we act on it by m x a tensor n y b. So we need to check if you actually want to believe that this is a correlation. We need to check that for any fixed x and y, this defines a uh, uh, probability distribution. So since the M's and N's are positive operators. Is, hmm? Psi is fixed and for every such psi. Yeah, 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 psi is fixed. And so P depends on psi. Yeah, exactly. P depends on the M's, the sequence of M's, the sequence of N's, and on the specific psi that I chose. And okay, so let's just uh, check the heuristics that everything should work out. Um, this is an inner product of uh, the image of psi under a positive operator with psi itself. 
So by the positivity of the operator, this is some non-negative real number, right? So this is greater or equal to zero. And uh, if you just sum all of these things up, uh, where the sum goes over all A's and B's, because of this condition, you will just get the inner product of psi with itself, which is uh, one because this is a unit vector. So this is actually a conditional distribution, a conditional probability distribution whenever you fix X and Y. Great, so why is this the definition? Uh, I'm not going to talk about at all today, but just take it as a fact when you uh, define uh, the possible correlations coming from uh, the tensor product model of quantum mechanics. These are the possible correlations that the players can use. Okay, so um, maybe it's a good exercise. Um, those who don't uh, th like that want to think about something when uh, when I talk, either wh whether they know some of these things or not, uh, can think of the following uh, exercise, okay? Um, every classical correlation is a quantum correlation. Okay, so just check that the convex hull of the deterministic correlation sits inside uh, this definition. Okay, so this is a bigger, potentially bigger set. Great. Now I want to talk about a third model, uh, which get, will give us uh, a third set of correlations. These are called quantum commuting. So beforehand, I chose a, a natural number n, and this is, was the same as choosing some Hilbert space. Okay, so we just chose c to the n tensor c to the n. This was our Hilbert space in the uh, quantum uh, model. In the quantum commuting model, we just choose uh, H to be a separable Hilbert space. Um, and we again need for any question sequences of POVMs, but their definitions will be uh, slightly different. So for any X in I, I want, uh, we need to, def to define our correlation, we need sequence of again, M X A and N X A, A and O, A and O. And again, we want such that all of them are bounded operators on this Hilbert space. Um, they sum up to the identity, so M, x a sum over a is equal to n x a sum over a is equal to the identity operator on this Hilbert space. Um, and we need two more conditions. So uh, the m a x's and n x a's are positive operators in the functional analysis sense. Um, and additionally, this is called quantum commuting. So the last uh, condition that I need is that uh, for any X, Y, A, and B, M, X, A times N, Y, B is equal to N, Y, B times M, X, A. So Sorry, uh, the can I ask a question. Um, when we, yeah, in, sure, uh, sure. Quant now you've turned to quantum computing, why would I ever want to look at Hilton? Are these Hilbert spaces finite dimensional? No, 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 no. So, so why in quantum computing would I worry ever? Uh, I didn't say that it's quantum computing. I said this is called the quantum commuting model of yeah, quantum got mechanics. The... Uh, okay. I think that- Oh, the... oh so it's just, this is not anything to do with quantum computing yet, okay. Ah, uh, no, not yet. You will see what okay. is the connection. Uh, in okay, humans, okay. In but, terms uh, of quantum mechanics, I'm happy, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Like this is some model. Uh, it's useful in some cases. Great. So we I, I have just walked this... in and I, I read commuting is computing. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'll move along. So the last, uh, so we had the unit vector beforehand, right? So we need an, again, a unit vector now. So, uh, but instead of taking psi from the tensor product of H with itself, we just take, take psi inside H, a unit vector. And again, my claim is that P of, uh, I didn't write here, but these are called the quantum correlations and I denote them by CQ. 
And here the correlation is P of A, B given X, Y is, is almost the same definition. This is a Hilbert space. So we have an inner product. You take Psi on the right-hand side and you take M, X, A, N, Y, B acting on Psi on the left-hand side. You take their inner product. You get some non-negative number. This is the probability that the players will answer A and B given that they were asked X and Y. And this set is called quantum commuting. So I denote it by CQC. Great, so we have three correlation sets. And I stated that uh, these correlation sets come from uh, mathematical models of uh, mechanics, either classical in the first case and, or quantum uh, in the two uh, other cases. Now there was this uh, famous paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen that uh, talked about the spooky action at a distance. And uh, actually you can interpret part of, their, uh, uh, part of the paper as asking whether every classical correlation, uh, every quantum correlation is also a classical correlation. Okay, so you in can interpret some of their questions as such. And in his famous paper from 1964, uh, Bell, defined uh, his Bell experiment and uh, showed that actually there are quantum correlations that are not classical correlations, okay? And I'm going to show you the proof uh, by Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt, and I'm going to define it using a game. So we started by defining games, and I want to prove you uh, the following theorem uh, using games. So the claim is that there exists a game such that its classical value, a game G, such that its classical value is strictly smaller than its quantum value. This in particular says that there are quantum correlations that are not classical correlations. Excuse me, can you just Great. very quickly scroll up to the definition of value? Yeah, okay, so let's recall what is the value. So given a game uh, and a subset of the set of all correlations, the T value of the game is just the supremum of all expectations of winning the game, given that the players are using the probability distribution T. Okay, so this is just winning expectation, winning expectation given the players are using P. So no matter how they uh, generate in the physical world, the strategy that, uh, make, that enables them, them to use P, uh, we believe that they are using this specific P and ask what is the winning expectation in the game. And we take the supremum over all possible correlations inside this subset. Is it okay, Arya? Yes, thank you. So specifically, if you know that for two subsets of the correlation, so if for two sets, CT and CT prime, the T value and the T prime value are different, specifically, they are not the same set. So this is a way of distinguishing between such sets. Uh, excuse me, one more question uh, before you move yeah. on to the... Uh, is this uh, quantum commuting a generalization of quantum? If you replace H yeah, so you can check. Product. Yeah, you can check that actually. If you re replace H here by c to the n tensor c to the n, and you replace m and n by m tensor the identity and the identity tensor n, uh, every instance of the qu the quantum uh, any quantum correlation instance can be described as a quantum commuting correlation this, uh, instance. All right. Thank okay, you. so the, it is a sequence of uh, increasing uh, sets. Yeah, and they are going to commute. Like, That's... Yeah, exactly, yeah, because I okay. took the tensor, like one of them acts only on the left part and one acts only yes. on the right part of the... All right, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Uh, great, so uh, let's sketch the proof. So the way I'm going to prove it is, I'm not actually going to prove it, I'm just going to uh, define a game. Uh, this is called the CHSH game. And uh, it defines, it, it is defined as follows. Uh, we need to define the input and output set. So first of all, the input and output set are the same. 
And these are just uh, elements from the field with two elements. So these are just single bits. So the referee sends a single bit to each player and the players need to answer with a single bit to the referee. Um, the probability distribution that we use is the uniform one. Okay, over pairs of questions. So one quarter for any pair of possible questions. And the interesting part is the uh, winning predicate. So for V of A, B, given X is, and Y is one, if and only if the following equation holds, A plus B is equal to X times Y. Okay, so th this is a very, a, a, an easily defined game. Um, and my claim is that uh, the classical, uh, the optimal classical uh, uh, correlation uh, gives you a winning expectation which is strictly smaller than some quantum correlation. Um, so recall that the classical correlations are just a convex hull of the deterministic ones. And the value of the game is just optimizing some functional over this convex, actually this is a polytope, this is a finite number of deterministic uh, things. So you just need to check what happens on the vertices. So you have like a finite list of checks that you need to check going over all the vertices of the polytope, to check which one of, gives you the maximal value and this is the classical uh, value of the game. Okay, so in this case, you can just do the check, um, the classical value of CHSH is uh, three quarters. Now uh, you can take it as an exercise. Uh, what is the actual uh, um, deterministic uh, uh, correlation that they use to win this game? Okay, and, and my claim, which is not that uh, obvious, is that the quantum value of this game oops, is one half plus one over two square root of two. Okay, and uh, this can be achieved using uh, matrices. So uh, in the quantum correlations, you recall, we had sequences of matrices and we had the dimension of the matrices. So uh, I claim you can achieve this number uh, by using two by two matrices. Okay, so there are sequence of two by two matrices and a, a unit vector in C, C squared tensor C squared. So it's C to the four uh, that gives you some correlation that wins here with this probability. And it's a famous uh, work by Cyrilson that shows that this is also an upper bound. Okay, so uh, this is maybe uh, not so clear uh, in advance, but this is also an upper bound on uh, uh, the value of the quantum value of these games. Actually also on the, qu the quantum commuting value. So also the quantum commuting value of this game is bounded by this number. This is what Cyrilson's proved. Um, Great, so this is one game that uh, shows that uh, the classical correlations are strictly smaller than the quantum ones. The second one that I want to talk about is called magic square and it will be uh, important later. Oops. Great, so what is the magic square game? You have a grid uh, of three by three. Whoops, this was too short. Here it was too short again. Okay. Great, so we have a grid of three by three and uh, I need to explain what are the questions and answers. So the possible questions are just row one, row two, row three, column one, column two and column three. The outputs are just vectors in F2 cube. Uh, the distribution is the uniform one over pairs from this set I. And again, I need to explain what is the, um, what is the um, winning predicate. So when I send a question like column two to the player Alice, I, she answers with uh, a triplet of bits. So I think of her answer as just filling up the second column. 
Okay, so if, for example, ans uh, Alice answered with zero, one, zero, uh, I just put the zero, one, zero in the second column. And for example, if I ask Bob for the first row, uh, he will give uh, a triplet of numbers. And I just think of him as filling up uh, these, uh, uh, the entries of this row. So for example, one, one, zero. Okay, and for them to win, they need to satisfy the following thing. If they were asked for a column, the sum of the entries in the column needs to be one. If they were asked for a row, the sum of entries uh, should be zero. And if they were asked for a row and the column in such a way that they are intersecting, they need to give the same uh, answer. So they need to be consistent with one another. So you can see that Alice gave a satisfying uh, input to the second column. Bob gave a satisfying input to the first uh, row, but they were oh, inconsistent with one it's another. It's a little confusing, Michael. It's a little yes. confusing. Oh, there are outputs. Yeah. So these are the their outputs, but I interpret them as writing numbers in the first row and the second column. Okay, great. So this is a, a losing condition because Alice and Bob are inconsistent. But if Bob would have answered instead of one one zero one zero one, we can see that the conditions are now satisfied. The sum of the row is zero. The sum of the column is one, and now they both answered zero to the common bracket that they need to be that they needed to fill. Okay, great. So um, this is again uh, not that easy uh, of a task, but checking that the classical correlations are bounded by something. So this is magic square. So the classical uh, value of this game is at most eight ninths. And this is because this is a system of linear equation that cannot be satisfied fully. So you can just need to check what is the best you can, uh, what are the best uh, um, uh, choices. Yeah, choices of zero and ones. And you see that uh, they win at most with eight ninths, uh, eight ninths of the times. And uh, if you want to check the quantum value of this game is actually one. So a bit surprisingly, although this system of equation cannot be satisfied simultaneously, uh, players that use quantum correlations can fool us 100% of the time. It seems that as if they have a satisfying uh, assignment to this uh, system of linear equations. Great. So uh, now I want to talk about Cyrilson's problem. So uh, similarly to the question of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, uh, Cyrilson asked whether uh, the quantum set, the set of quantum correlation is the same as the set of quantum commuting correlations. And actually, uh, he didn't ask for the specific quantum set, he uh, asked for the closure of this quantum correlation set. Okay, so whether the closure of CQ is the same as CQC. And I'm giving the game version. So uh, if this is, uh, one of them implies the other, but it's not the true the other way around. This is potentially a harder thing. So maybe the sets are different, but always the, the uh, value is the same. So potentially this can happen. So this is the game's version uh, of Cyrilson's problem, whether the quantum value of any game is the same as the quantum commuting value of this game. Great, so I finished my first part of the talk. I'll take a sip of water. And this is the same, the famous uh, Cyrilson's problem that is uh, uh, the same, like uh, equivalent to Cohn's and Betty. Okay, so. Uh, this is also equivalent to quantum embedding problem. Now I want to relate that my now my goal is to relate quantum embedding conjecture to these games. Okay, so uh, and I'm going to construct some algebraic structure using games. So to that end, I need to narrow my uh, scope of instead of talking about all games, talking only about synchronous games. So this is a subset of all games. Um, so a game is called synchronous if it satisfies the following uh, condition. If for any A that is not equal to B inside O and any X in I, V of A, B, X, X is zero. 
okay? And the dramatized way of explaining it is if I send the same question to both players, they must answer with the same answer. Okay, so any game that satisfies this condition is called synchronous. Now I want to define using a synchronous game an algebra. Okay, so this will be a star algebra. It's called the, uh, the synchronous algebra of the game or just the game algebra. Um, and it is defined as follows. Um, so A of G is the star algebra. So I'm just denoting it in this way generated. Uh, so I'm going to give a finitely presented star algebra. Okay, so you take the non-commuting polynomials in the generators that I'm uh, giving you now together with their formal conjugates and you mod out by the ideal generated by the relations that I'm going to give in a moment. So what are the generators? So for any pair of question and answer, we take a single generator. So EXA for any question and answer. Now, what are the relations? So uh, the first relation is that all of these uh, generators are projectors. So their square is equal to themselves and they are self-conjugate. So they are uh, orthogonal projections. Also, they sum up to the identity when you sum over the A's. So maybe I will not write it as the identity matrix, just uh, the complex number one. Okay, so this is uh, my first conditions. This seems very similar uh, to the POVM criteria, right? So uh, if you fix X, the set, the sequence of EXAs uh, is a positive operator valued measure. Actually, it's a projective valued measure. So uh, it's even more restrictive. Um, and finally, okay, so these are the first two conditions. The last condition is that Forever, for every A, B, X, and Y, V of A, B, X, and Y equals zero implies that the product E, X, A times E, Y, B is equal to zero. So a priori, it's not at all clear that this uh, algebra is not trivial, right? So maybe this ideal kills everything, but we don't, actually care. We are just going to say that there is some relation between algebraic properties of this specific algebra and, uh, and our game, our synchronous game. Any questions about the definition of the algebra? No? Great. So this is just a star algebra, though I denoted that by C star, it's just, uh, it doesn't have a norm on it or anything yet. Uh, now, uh, there is now a, a very interesting theorem uh, that was proved in a sequence of papers by uh, these fine gentlemen. Um, and to explain what is the theorem, I need to uh, first define what is the hyperfinite to one factor for those who don't know. Uh, so you can take the two by two matrices, so any two by two matrix, you can uh, just send to the four by four matrices by writing it as a block matrix of this kind. And you can do it iteratively. So it uh, embeds the two by two matrices in the four by four into the eight by eight matrices and so on. Uh, and you can take the direct limit of this uh, thing. And this is called uh, the hyperfinite to one factor. Okay, this is one instance of the hyperfinite to one factor. Um, and given a synchronous game, I want to relate now the, uh, values of the game with properties of the algebra. So if the quantum commuting value of this game is one, this is if and only if there exists a homomorphism phi from our algebra A of G into some C star algebra X. Okay, so X is a C star algebra. No, not that C, C star algebra with a racial state. Okay, so uh, this is 
again, uh, uh, some condition on the algebra X, okay? So we have some homomorphism, unital homomorphism of algebras, of star algebras uh, from our algebra A of G into some C star algebra with a tracial state defined on it. Those of you who don't know what a tracial state is, it doesn't really matter for this part of the, like, it's, it's important, but uh, for now, I'm not going to explain what it is. Um, now, I'm, I want to give uh, a characterization of what happens when you have quantum commuting, quantum value one. So the quantum value of the game is one. This is if and only if you have a homomorphism from your A of G to uh, R omega, where this is the uh, metric ultra product of the hyperfinite two one factor. So we see this, we saw this kind of construction during our seminar already. Um, these uh, metric ultra products, um, and this is just an instance of them. And what is important here, let's just see that everything compiles. So clearly, if you have quantum value one, you must have quantum commuting value one because this set embeds in this set. And the only thing you need to believe is that uh, this is a sister algebra with the tracial state defined on it. And this is true. So this is a sister algebra with tracial state on it. With tracial state. Okay, so uh, this, Theorem connects between uh, the quantum and quantum commuting value to these uh, representations of this algebra. Okay. Can you scroll now, back to the, uh, the theorems? These are C style algebra, I mean, Helton and uh, Helton. So were they stated in terms of games? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we uh, um, even like. In most, at least in two, I think, no, in all of these papers, they, they state it in a more elaborate way, but at, at the end, they write some kind of corollary. And the corollary is, if the quantum commuting value of the game is one, this is if and only if there is a homomorphism from this algebra to a sister algebra with tracial state, with tracial state. So this is the way they are uh, introduced in their papers. Okay. Um. Uh, excuse me, I, I have a, a question because you see the quantum, the quantum uh, game and quantum commuting, the difference in two ways because we have tensor product and finite dimension. Yes, what is important here that it is tensor product or finite dimension? Um, actually, the, the fact that we took. Uh, the, the fact that we took a finite dimension is not relevant when you take the supremum. You can show that the supremum over finite dimensional and the supremum over infinite dimensional using the tensor product model are the same. Okay, so in in the sense of the value, you just don't care. Okay. Uh, but the important thing is whether you let whether you think of them spatially uh, separated. So you have two labs, and the world is just the tensor product of these labs, or your operator somehow. Uh, work on all the space, but just commute. So this is the, the difference between the models uh, physically. Okay, so um, let me just say, okay, so now I'm giving a theorem from this famous, now famous uh, MIP star is equal to RE. And uh, the part that we care now from this uh, paper is that they constructed a game, a specific game, you can write it down, possibly, probably you cannot write it down because it will be too long, but if you follow their paper, paper uh, a computer potentially can write down the full uh, question, answer, and uh, verification uh, uh, procedure and all of that. Uh, having the following property, so it's a, a synchronous game. So first of all, it's a synchronous game. And the quantum commuting value of this game uh, is one, while the quantum value of this game is bounded by one half, bounded from above by one half. So let's just see before the break. So I'm uh, I'm going to when I finish the to explain the following corollary, uh, we will take a break. 
let's see that cones abetting conjecture is refuted by this, uh, these two, the theorem that I uh, said of uh, Kim, Paulson, Schaffhausen, uh, et al. And uh, this uh, theorem by Jean, Ataraj, and Vidi, Kreit, and Yuan. Um, so, okay, we have A of G. We know that it has quantum commuting value one. So it has a, a homomorphism into X, which is a C star algebra with trace. Now, because it has a trace, you can take the GNS representation of this algebra, and then you have some map into, uh, let's call it Y, that sits inside the bounded operators of some Hilbert space. Okay, so this is the GNS representation. Um, now you can just take, whoops, I'm going to take it here. You can just take the uh, von Neumann closure of this Y. Okay, so you take Y, close it, von Neumann. Now uh, it was a C star algebra beforehand. Now it's a von Neumann algebra and it inherits the tracial state from X. So you can show that this still has, still has a tracial state defined on it. Well, so then, now, now, could you, can you just say what a tracial state is just so that we know what you, roughly what you're talking about? You yeah, said it's not it's important. yeah, yeah, so it's a functional from the algebra yeah. to the complex numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, that sends one to one, mm -hmm. which is positive, meaning it sends positive elements to non-negative real numbers. Uh, and it is uh, um, continuous in some topology, okay? So uh, it's like the existence of a trace on- Ah, uh, 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 and also it, it satisfies T of A, B is equal to T of B, A. Okay. So, and this is exactly the tracial property. So okay. yeah. the, the first thing that I said is called the state and when it's, it has also this property, it's called the tracial state. Mm -hmm. In the, uh, Peter, in this uh, hyperfinite example, which is the union of the matrix, uh, this is simply the normalized trace, you know, that you take the yeah. trace mm -hmm. dimension, and that's yeah. why this, all this is really about the Hilbert Schmidt ma uh, uh, mm -hmm. matrix, and the results are very different with the Frovenius metric and all the other things that we discussed in this seminar. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. great. Okay, so now let's assume by contradiction that cones embedding conjecture was true. So I didn't tell you what cones embedding conjecture is, but it states that these kinds of algebras for Neumann algebras with tracial state that are separable can be embedded in R omega. So this is assuming cones embedding conjecture, assuming cones embedding conjecture. But what did we get here? We got a composition of homomorphisms that sends AG to R omega. But if we have a composition of such homomorphisms, the quantum value of the game must be one. So actually this is not just a refutation of cones embedding conjecture. This is a very strong uh, refutation because you don't need even embedding here. We constructed an algebra that has no homomorphism into our omega. This is a very strong contradiction to cones embedding conjecture. Okay, great. So um, the uh, in the, the next hour, I'm going to discuss- Why, why it has no, uh, why it has no? Because any homomorphism from Y for Neumann's closure to our omega, you can compose it with the previous homomorphisms and you will get a homomorphism from AG to R omega. But we stated that any, homomorphism from AG to R omega automatically implies that the quantum value of the game is one. But mm -hmm. here the quantum value of the game is bounded by one half. Before you take a break, and since you're gonna leave this uh, theorem that had a funny name to it that I've scrolled back, uh, R, yeah, M I P star equals R E, <laughs> can't even. Um, can I will explain say, what it can, means. Can, are you, can you say, I assume we're leaving that now and you're going to, or are you going to return? I will, to I will define it uh, at the end of the talk because okay. I need, uh, I, okay, so let me motivate you for staying to the second part of the talk. The, my goal is to ask you, okay, now we showed something about these star algebras. When does 
a of g equals some group ring of some finitely presented group. This is the, uh, um, the point of my second part of the talk because we are motivated uh, to find non-hyperlinear groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'm going to even uh, narrow my scope even uh, further uh, and talk about a subclass of synchronous games uh, whose uh, group, uh, whose game algebra is exactly the group ring of some group. Uh, so this will be the second part, and then I will discuss this thing yeah. and maybe the, uh, explain what is the problem in this uh, proof regarding uh, uh, the... All right. uh, so you'll explain what, I mean, I assume their main interest was not the, to disprove this uh, con conjecture, but to prove whatever is written there. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so you'll give us um, an idea of what I, they... I think, okay, I'll explain what it means. Yeah, I think now you we have all the tools to understand what is MIP stuff. Uh, okay. I'll explain near the end. Okay. So, thanks. Michael, can you give us a minute of, you know, what, what's ahead? Where, where are you headed now? Yeah, I, I just said I'm going to define a subclass of synchronous games that are called linear constraint system games. Uh, this subclass, all, all its group uh, game groups, uh, game algebras, are group rings of some uh, group. And I'll explain what is the group. Uh, and at the end, I will try to explain how far is the game from MIP star is equal to RE to being an, a linear constraint system game. Okay, so there is a specific place in the uh, work which is clearly a problem, and the other parts of the of their work seems not to be a problem, linearizing them in the sense that I'm going to explain. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to give a specific open question that probably if one can answer it, uh, he can like uh, lemanef. How, how do I say lemanef? <laughs> uh, upgrade. Yeah, upgrade it to a construction of non-hyperlinear groups. Uh, how long is the break now? Can you tell us? Um, Alex? Uh, Let's take 10 minutes. Okay, good. Will we, will we realistically finish in 10 minutes and an hour's talk, or is this completely... Uh, I, think, I think I can get to the interesting parts, yeah. Um, I just need to dis define these linear constraint system games and uh, give you some understanding of MIP star is equal to RE, and I'll, uh, I'll be there. Okay. So we reconvene in 10 minutes? Yeah. yeah I think 6, uh, yeah, and 12.05 in Princeton time, right? 10 minutes from now. Tell me for now, yeah, it's international seminar, better not to use any local coordinates. 10 minutes. <laughs> use your fingers, they throw it.
חזרת או שעוד הגייסות אה, עוד... אה... אני ראיתי כשאתה כבר ראיתי. Let's give one more minute and then we can I think we can stop Okay, Michael, I think you can go ahead. Okay, great. So I'll start with just noticing that I think I, I brushed through uh, this theorem without showing you that actually it's, a, it's quite uh, um, natural. Okay, so we defined this uh, uh, algebra, this game algebra, in such a way that there will be relations between representations of this algebra and the uh, winning uh, 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 correlations that win perfectly in the game. So let, let, me, let me just show how you can deduce this part of the first clause of the theorem. Okay, so assume you have a quantum commuting strategy that wins perfectly. Good, I, I don't I'm know. Going to... I, I see this uh, on, in tiny. I mean, it was much bigger. Yeah, before. it's very small. I just wanted you both oh. to see what is the claim. The claim is that if you have quantum commuting value one, then there is such a homomorphism, okay, from AG to X with the threshold state. And I also wanted you to see the definition of the algebra. Okay, this is why I, I chose to show it in such a small uh, way. But let, let me just uh, say it here. So um, what is the perfect strategy? So you can show that uh, the quantum commuting correlations are a closed set. Okay, so this is the first thing you need to know. And the second thing you need to know is that any quantum uh, commuting correlation can be achieved using projective valued measures and not only a positive operator valued measures. So actually you have a sequence of MXAs, A and O, and NXAs, A and O, uh, and some Psi in some H, uh, such that if you calculate the, uh, um, the value using uh, this, uh, this data, you have one. But the point is that this condition uh, exactly implies that uh, Okay, the fact that you have value one exactly implies that MAX times uh, NYB is equal to zero whenever V of AB XY zero. So actually if you just send, so my claim is if you just send EXA to MXA, you get some homomorphism from this algebra AG uh, into the bounded operator. So these are bounded operators on some Hilbert space. And if you take the algebra generated by this MA axis, uh, this is a sister algebra. Uh, so you take the sister closure of this uh, algebra that generated by then, this is a sister algebra. And because we have this Psi, it has a, a, a trace defined on it. Okay, so actually it, it seems a bit cryptic the way I uh, showed it before uh, the, the break, but actually this uh, algebra was uh, designed in such a way that to find the actual uh, homomorphism from this algebra into the sister algebra with the trace is very straightforward, okay? So uh, maybe the other way around is a bit more uh, 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 complicated, starting from a homomorphism and constructing uh, a strategy, um, but it is also possible. And so th this is on the one hand, 
an interesting and deep result. There are many tools that goes into this, uh, this fact, but the, the algebra itself is designed in a way that everything is, here is very natural. Great. Now, as I stated, I want to talk about linear constraint system games. So this, this is a subset of synchronous games uh, that are even more restrictive. So um, the game always consists of sending uh, some equations out of a system of linear equations to the players, and the players need to uh, give uh, answers that are both consistent and satisfy the equations that they were sent. Okay, so given, uh, so L and B are just the, uh, the things that define the system of uh, the linear system of equations uh, over the field with two elements. Um, and now the questions are just uh, numbers between one and M. Whoa. Okay, so M is the number of equations. You see that L is a matrix of size M by N. So the questions are just, uh, the index of some uh, equation out of the system. The outputs are just vectors inside F2 to the N. So these are just uh, putting numbers to each variable. Um, the distribution is the uniform one and defining the winning predicate is uh, a bit uh, harder. So let, let me try to explain. I, I'm replacing this X and Y with I and J. So if I sent to Alice equation I, and I sent to Bob equation J, I want their answer to satisfy the equation. So this is exactly saying that L times the answer of Alice, if I check what is the ith coordinate of this, this should be the same as the ith coordinate of the right hand side vector of the linear equation. And similarly, I check the answer of Bob satisfies the J equation. Now I have two additional con uh, conditions. One of them uh, checks that this is a synchronous game and the other one uh, checks the consistency. Okay, so if L I K is equal to zero, I want that U of K is equal to zero. And similarly, if L J K is equal to zero, I want V of K to, Z to be zero. So if I add these conditions, this game becomes uh, um, a, a synchronous game, yeah. And I want the last condition, I want that if LIK is equal to LJK is equal to one, I want UK to be equal to VK. No matter whether they are zero or one, I want them to be the same. This is the consistency uh, condition. Okay, Michael, great. I forgot so about just... in your notation, what is the answer and what is the question? Like the um, U and V are the answers. So I, I denoted them with an arrow so you can remember that this is a vector in F2 to the N. And I and yeah. J's are just indices of the equations. So these are the num enumerations of the rows. Thank you. You're welcome. So you can check that the magic square game, for example, uh, is a linear constraint system game. So, and the CHSH game is not a linear constraint system game. Actually, the CHSH game is not even a synchronous game, okay? Um, so this is just a linear constraint system game. The point just, is that- just to, oh, so, so we had just, so just to connect it to, to the, the magic uh, square. So there is an equation for each row and there is an equation for each column, right? And- uh... You're correct, yeah. So the, the number M is six. One, two, three are the rows, four, five, six are the columns, for example. And uh, this is the way I interpret it. And N is three. So, uh, and no, actually N is nine. I think that they fill up their row and they put zeros in all other places. This is the, this condition. Okay. Um, now, I want to define the game group. So beforehand we had the game algebra, but for linear constraint system games, if we have this, uh, uh, we, if we have a system of linear equation over F2, we can define the following group. Uh, the generators are just uh, X1 up to Xn. So these, these are the number of variables in the system of equations. And we add an additional generator that we call J. So this is S that we call J. And now what are the relations? So we have, uh, 
uh, lots of relations. Let me write them down. So first of all, all the generators are of order two. So this is my first uh, condition. My second condition is that J is a central element. So it commutes with everything. Um, my third condition is that whenever two variables appear in the same equation, they must commute. So let's write it down. Whenever L I K is equal to L I K prime, it x is equal to one. It implies, so this is the complex number one. This is one of the uh, group gamma. Um, then the uh, commutator of xk and xk prime is the identity element. And finally, uh, this, is, this comes from a, a system of linear equations. So we want the equations to get inside. So for any i between one and m, we want that the product of xj to the power lij, j goes from uh, one to n, is equal to j to the power b at the i coordinate. So this is just the product. Okay, so any linear equation, you can take minus one to the power of this linear equation, okay? So this is the minus one to the power of the linear equation interpretation of the system, okay? This condition, the last one. Great, so we have a group. This is good. Why, what do you mean minus one? X, J? Yeah, so you, you replace, uh, um, so any Straight linear equation K. over, you have the choice. think of it as minus one, one to the X, I, you, you multiply all the minus one to the X, I, Okay, x1, xn, and it needs to be minus one to the bi, okay? So I think j, j is a replacement for minus one. Okay, I think of j as the minus one of the group because groups don't have necessarily a minus one. No, but what, I don't understand. What, this is minus one to the... Every, uh, every equation, so alpha, x, alpha one, x1, alpha... So every equation, uh, alpha one, x1 plus alpha n x n is equal to uh, b, uh, okay, alpha i1 up to alpha i n is equal to b i. So this is the kind of uh, equations that you see and everything here is over uh, the field with two elements, right, Alex? No error over so, the head of b i, right? It's a number, it's a bit. Uh, yeah, no, it's the ith coordinate of the vector b. So I, I wrote it that way beforehand uh, also. Um, maybe confused about the, the what, what does it mean now now I mean that Alex if you have such a condition you can you it's just the, the same way that you tra translate linear functions uh, from uh, into f2 to characters into the complex numbers you do the same thing you take minus one to this thing and no, minus what's one the relation I, what's the meaning of the relation Don't, product j goes from one up to n x j to the l i j Lij is a matrix, it has zeros and ones in it. So you just write down, this is a relation. So X1 to the power of what appears in the matrix. So it's either, right. a, either a zero or a one. What did this has to do with minus one to the- Alex, Xj of the relations is minus one to the Xj of the equations. So the notation is confusing. If yeah, what's... maybe the notation is cool. Say again, Oren. In, in the relations, Alex, yeah. think that in the relations we call the xj yj, okay? So just I give it another name, I replace all the xj by yj. And then if yj is minus one to the xj, then it makes sense. If yj- okay, If you write here yj, you replace the generators here y1 to yn, and everything here is in y, then a, a solution to the system of equations, uh, uh, you can interpret it as minus one to the xi, where xi are solution to the system of equations as just being yi, okay? Something like that, maybe j is better here. The point is uh, that this I is some understand. kind of- I mean, this is a group where xi are abstract objects. Yeah, you're right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is between hot minus button. 1 just, to the xi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To the, to the power is, xj. This is just an intuition, Alex. I, if it only confuses you, I think it's a, it, it is probably a bad intuition. But there is this notion of uh, uh, replacing linear things into 0, 1 by uh, uh, things that are uh, um, multiplicative into plus minus 1. Okay? So my claim is that this is the same idea. So you can replace, instead of thinking of satisfying a linear a system of linear equations, mm -hmm. satisfy a system of multiplicative equations where the right-hand side is, also, is either plus one or minus one. Okay. Okay, so the, this is a, an interpretation. This is very convenient uh, intuition if you're used to working with Boolean functions. But uh, as Michael said, you can ignore it. It's, you, don't, you don't need it. It doesn't so, help yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So if, if it only confuses you, I'll, I'm, let's ignore what I just said. This is just a group. The point is that simil, in, oh, in a similar fashion... A big group fashion, theory is easier than linear algebra, so... <laughs> what? Say again, Alex? No, this is not universal. This is a not big universal. group theory is easier than linear algebra, so... <laughs> yeah, so we are now okay. at the group theory uh, uh, realm. Uh, so I don't want to actually say what is the group of the magic square game. I think it's a good exercise. Think about it if you want to understand what is the game group of the magic square game. But now I want to... Uh, say, uh, a word, say a word about this. Don't, don't uh, keep us in suspense. Just a word. Okay, it's the two-qubit Pauli group. Uh, it's uh, okay. some quotient okay. of the the hydral group times itself, the four uh, of the square. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, my claim now is that in a similar fashion to the case where there is a relation between the algebras and uh, uh, the values of the game, we have again some relation between properties, algebraic properties of the group and uh, properties of the game. So first of all, I, I'm not going to explain why, but I claim that A of G is the same as the group ring of, I called it, this, this group is called gamma LB. Okay, so the game algebra of GLB, of the linear constraint system game, no, no error here, error here. Um, the, the game algebra of this game is the same as the group ring of this group. Okay, this is not as easy to see, but uh, I claim that this is true. Um, and now I want to relate properties of this group to uh, um, the quantum commuting uh, value and the quantum value. So I claim that, uh, again, these uh, fine gentlemen prove the following. So the quantum commuting value of the linear constraint system game defined by the matrix L and the right-hand side vector B is one if and only if J is not the identity element in the group. So we have a group defined by generators and relations. Sometimes the, gener the generator J is killed in this process. It just becomes one. Sometimes it doesn't. I claim that whenever the generator uh, J is not equal to one, uh, the quantum commuting value of the game is one. Okay, great. So this is a nice uh, characterization. Uh, the characterization with quantum value of the game, uh, this thing is one, if and only if there exists a homomorphism of groups from gamma LB to the unitary, uh, unitary operators of R omega. This is very reminiscent of the notion of hyperlinear groups, right? So if I would have written an embedding from gamma LB into U of R omega, this was the definition of a non of a yes hyperlinear group. Um, so now I'm not claiming that having quantum value one is equivalent to being hyperlinear. I'm just claiming that there is some uh, unitary representation uh, uh, in the hyperfinite to one, the ultra product of the hyperfinite to one factor of this group that separates J and one, such that 
phi of j is not phi of one. So again, clearly, if the homomorphism separates j and one, specifically, they are not the same element in the group, right? So clearly, this thing implies this thing, right? Uh, so this is just a good sanity check. Um, and now it is very clear what one can do, okay? If you can find a group, if you can find a game, which is a linear constraint system game, it has quantum commuting value one, and its quantum value is bounded by something that is strictly smaller than one, then you constructed a non-hyperlinear group. Why is it a non-hyperlinear group? Because you cannot find an embedding because any function, any homomorphism from this group to U of R omega cannot separate J and one. Although in the original group, they are separated. Is this clear? I, I think this is a very important point. So if, if you yeah. still want to be with me, maybe it's a good time to ask questions. But now uh, to prove that the I mean, from the group theory point of view, I mean, I see the difficulty to prove that J is not equal to one. I mean, it's kind of, but it's on the other end, it's kind of the kind of problem the combinatorial group theory uh, deals with. Um, if you write such a game, how difficult is to prove that the, the, the quantum, uh, that this value of quantum value is equal to one? Usually it's uh, very hard. Like you need to understand the game uh, in, qu in quite a good fashion, Ex especially if there is no quantum uh, strategy that gives you one, right, Alex? Like if you have some finite dimensional thing, you can just write down the, the, the matrices, but potentially it can be extremely hard. Like you but were talking so about infinite dimensional Hilbert don't spaces. don't have uh, examples which you can say uh, I, uh, that you can prove this, the left-hand side kind of and say, okay, I, I, uh, I don't know now if I, uh, if the classical one, I mean, I don't know if they are uh, not, not hyperlinear, you know, I cannot prove two, but at least I can prove one. Do you have such examples? Um... I don't have such examples, but in the papers uh, uh, that I showed before, there are many examples of all these chromatic uh, numbers, this, these quantum chromatic numbers and quantum commuting chromatic numbers and things like that. And I think they do have examples of such things, um, but I don't think they are linear, const like they are linear constraint system games. I need to think about it. Um, maybe I'll, I'll say, uh, uh, um, a different thing, okay? So um, maybe uh, I don't have a good answer for you, Alex, uh, not from like uh, uh, to just shoot at you uh, some answer. Uh, I'm sure there are good answers to these questions. Um, I will not sketch the one because I don't have lots of time. And actually it depends on what do you want to see. I, I want to talk all, also about all this MAP star and things. So, uh, depends uh, mainly on what the audience want to hear. Um, but uh, I will say something about, uh, before I'm going to the all the MIP star is equal to RE, I want to say two things. The first one is related to uh, the second condition there. We saw that if the quantum value is one, there is some homomorphism, uh, some representation in the unitaries of the, uh, like some kind of hyperlinear representation that separates uh, one and J. And the point is that uh, actually, what does it mean to have quantum value one? It means that you have quantum strategies that approach one, right? Uh, better and better quantum strategies. Maybe the dimension gets larger and larger, but you have better and better quantum strategies for this game. And the point is that almost perfect quantum strategies are in con correspondence with what we called in this uh, seminar approximate representations of the group. So there is a relation between things that are almost representations of the uh, uh, game group and almost perfect quantum strategies. We can show that we can interchange between these two uh, things. And this is exactly what generates the homomorphism. 
Okay, so we have a sequence of uh, approximate representations of the group, and it defines an actual representation into the unitaries of the uh, ultra product of the hyperfinite to one factor. And maybe an interesting fact about uh, all these things, and this is a very deep result of Slostra, and maybe it will answer your question, Alex, at least partially, uh, is that uh, every finitely presented group embeds in some game group, okay? And uh, actually it can be even embedded in an interesting way. So if you have in your game, in your original group, a central element of order two, you can always send this central element to J. And also if you have generators that are of order two, you can check, you can send them to generators of gamma LB. Okay, so that actually it's, uh, it's even deeper than what I wrote here. And uh, actually a consequence of Slofstra's proof is that finding a finitely presented non-hyperlinear group is equivalent to find a linear constraint system game with perfect quantum commuting strategy and non, not perfect quantum value, okay? So he can show that if you, okay, so if you have such a game, clearly there is a non-hyperlinear group. He actually shows that the, the, it is also, also true the other way around, okay? So if you have a non-hyperlinear finite presented group, uh, then you can construct such a game. Okay, um, I have a quarter of an hour. Um, Alex, maybe you should tell me whether, uh, how much I need to get into this part. So I want to explain what part of uh, the game constructed in, in MIP star is equal to RE. At least for now, we don't know how to linearize it, to translate it into a linear constraint system game. So, because some parts of the construction, we know how to linearize. And some, and there is a specific part that we don't know. And I, to to explain that, I actually need to explain some complexity theory. So, um, um, I need some feedback from you guys. <laughs> Alex, speak up. I will. I'm, I'm a visitor here. No, no, good. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think uh, people and uh, Peter, I think, wanted to understand the uh, the title of this. Uh, MIP star equal uh, I, I would love to know what roughly what that means. I mean, yes, Avi no, gave no, a no. talk ah, and great. I didn't understand no, what no. it meant. Uh, so try to get to that. Yeah, uh, so I, so I think, I think I, I, now we have the tools to understand. It, so. 15 minutes or so, so go ahead. Yeah, okay. So I'll try to explain what is MIP and then you will, I will explain what is MIP star. So this is, a this is something in complexity theory. So you need to understand what is a decision problem. So a decision problem is just a subset of the natural numbers and you and the decision problem itself is deciding whether a natural number is in this subset or not in this subset. This is the way you should think of uh, decision problems, but usually the natural numbers themselves encode something. So for example, the, um, the, one of the classical uh, examples is that uh, you can encode any Turing machine as a string of bits every string of bits is a natural number. And for any Turing machine, they want to decide whether uh, it halts on the empty tape or it never halts on the empty tape. Okay, this is a kind of decision problem. Another very famous decision problem is the three coloring problem. Okay, so uh, given a graph, so again, you take some encoding. So for example, you write, you write down the adjacency matrix of a graph and you want to, uh, and this is the natural number that I'm asking about, and you want to decide whether um, this graph is three colorable or not three colorable. Okay, so these are decision problems. And a decision problem is in MIP. If you can translate any instance of this decision problem, so any natural number into a game in such a way that uh, the number is in the set, if the value of the game, the classical value of the game here, the important thing here is the word classical. Here, see, there is a classical. If the classical value of the game is one and the uh, number is not in the set, if the classical value of the game is bounded by one half. 
So I'll explain it using the graph uh, problem. So you get uh, the adjacency of a graph. You want to translate it to a game such that, uh, so the, a graph, let's call it X. So that such that X is pre-colorable if and only if the value, classical value of the game is one and X is not pre-colorable if and only if the classical value of the game is smaller or equal to one half. So Peter, I hope that uh, this is understandable because if it's not- uh, uh, So far it's good, uh, but you haven't brought it in complex. There's, not, there's a polynomial there. I'll, I'll wait for you. Yeah. Uh, no, no, actually uh, I wrote reduced efficiently. So this is the polynomial here. Uh, uh, the point is that any decision problem that you can uh, translate, this is polynomial, okay? so. In polynomial time, you can translate the instance of the uh, uh, the language that you try to decide about into a game. Uh, this is this is the thing that you need to do polynomially. But I don't care whether this is done. Like maybe co computing the value of the game, maybe it's uh, it's not polynomial. Okay, uh, maybe it's very hard to uh, 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 to check what is the classical so what value. What does of the MIP game. stand for? Ah, multi-prover interactive proofs. So you think of the game as the referee trying to compute something and the provers uh, trying to, uh, helping him compute this thing, okay? So uh, it's an interrogation process. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, but I think uh, th this name is a bit uh, confusing. It's just all decision problems that you can translate into a game that has this property. Um, and uh, you can do this the, uh, it, efficiently. It's not a... Turing kind of problem. It's it's decorated with polynomial reduction. It's a it's a complexity class, right? Yeah, this is a complexity class. Yeah. Okay. This is true. Uh, so we need this uh, uh, this reduction to be polynomial. So I wrote here efficiently. I meant uh, polynomial. Okay. Thanks. Polynomial in the input of the, in the instance of the decision problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I want to briefly give an example of a decision problem, which is uh, uh, different than tree coloring. It's called succinct tree coloring. So what is a succinct tree coloring instance? It's just some encoding. So you have some string of bits. Let's say that this string of bits is of size N. And this string of bits encodes a graph, which is exponentially larger. So. I don't explain here how I encode the graph, but there is a way to encode exponentially large graphs using only polynomially long uh, strings of bits. Okay, uh, and this and now if I am given such an encoding of a graph, I can still ask whether the graph that is being encoded here is three colorable, and this is the succinct three colorability uh, problem. So not all graphs can be compressed uh, in, ex in an exponential manner. But some graphs can be uh, compressed in such a way. And we want to ask if you get the compressed version of the graph, whether you can decide uh, if it is a uh, three colorable or not. So this is succinct three colorability. And in a very famous paper uh, by Babai, Fortno and Lund, uh, they showed that this decision problem is in MIP. So you can translate any uh, succinct encoding of a graph into a game in an efficient manner, such that uh, the game either has classical value one or classical value bounded away from one half. And this completely corresponds with the cases where the graph is three colorable and not three colorable. Great, so uh, this is a very famous result. And part of the result is something called arithmetization. So how did they do it? How did they translate this encoding into a game? So actually they translate the encoding of the graph and colorings of the graph into some condition on low degree polynomials over finite fields. Okay, so you get this encoding of a graph 
and you translate it into some polynomial over finite field. Uh, and you can show that you can, uh, there is a correspondence between some algebraic properties of these polynomials and uh, whether the graph is three colorable or not. Great. Um, now I want to, under, uh, to explain what MIP star is, and I have five minutes, so it will be enough. Great. So what is MIP star? It's the same thing replacing the classical value with the quantum value. So again, it's all decision problems that uh, you can efficiently, again, in polynomial time in the size of the input, uh, define a game using the uh, instance that either has quantum value one or has quantum value bounded by one half. If it has quantum value one, the instance is in the set. So the decision is yes. And if uh, the quantum value is bounded by one half, the decision is no. So this is just MIP star. It's uh, moving from calculating things about the classical value and calcul calculating things about the quantum value. And this is a much stronger, uh, maybe uh, intuitively, it's a much stronger uh, complexity uh, class because the quantum correlations are a much more intricate uh, set. Okay. Um, okay. Now, uh, in a series of papers that started with a paper by Ito and Vidic from 2012, uh, it was shown that also succinct three coloring is in MIP star three one. So it just means that you play the game instead with two players with three players. This was what the three means here. And afterwards in a series of papers, uh, they show that succinct three coloring is actually in MIP star two one. So two player games, as we talked about throughout this uh, lecture. And uh, Actually, um, although this is much weaker than the statement MIP star is equal to RE, so saying that MIP star is equal to RE um, just means that the halting problem, I wrote it here, it means that the halting problem is in MIP star to one. Deciding whether a, a given Turing machine halts, ever halts or never halts, um, a, is in MIP star to one. There is an efficient algorithm that translate any Turing machine to, into a game and uh, calculating the quantum value of the game is as hard as checking whether this, these Turing machines halt or not. But this is a much more modest thing to check, okay? And it is. it seems as if let this me, part just, of their let, paper- Michael, let me just make the trivial comment. <laughs> the whole thing is undecidable. Yeah, so there are uh, undecidable. Yeah, so I, that's MIP. exactly what I'm confused about. The whole thing is undecidable. The kind of un undecidable problems I understand, they have nothing to do with complexity. What is the content of this MIP star equals RE? What is it adding to the whole thing problem? What are you saying new okay, about the so, whole thing problem? Um, okay, so I'm claiming the following. Or any um, undecidable are, problem. Yeah, yeah, P Peter, let me, let me give you, okay, so. If I would ask you the following, I'm giving you a game. A game is a finite thing, okay? Decide whether this game has quantum value one or quantum value bounded away uh, from one half, okay? Just, you need to decide whether this is correct or this is correct. Okay. The answer is that this is as hard as the halting problem every instance of the halting problem can be translated into a game such that the uh, Turing machine halts if and only if the quantum but where's value the complexity is in that statement? That this reduction, you get a, 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 a Turing machine. You have an encoding of a Turing machine. Look, suppose I'm a Gödel Turing... and I'm saying, you know, okay, maybe there's a lost letter of Gödel, but there are problems that you can't, you don't have a decision procedure and the ones which are un, even independent of certain yeah, so axioms. The, the point uh, is that there are languages that are undecidable in MIP star to one. 
This is what like okay. there are there are uh, subsets of n that you have no algorithm to decide whether uh, an instance is in the uh, is not in the in the subset. Okay. Okay, you can Fair decide enough. whether it is in the language, but not if it, it is. Yeah, not. this I'm happy with. And there I'm are such with. languages. There are such languages in MIP star to one. Okay. You can think of it like we started with Turing machines, but why didn't we start with games? And th mm -hmm. this question should, could have been asked uh, long ago. Okay, so uh, we had quantum mechanics, we had models for quantum mechanics. Just decide whether the quantum value of the game is one or. What, what does RE stand for? Recu recu what is it stand for? Re recursively Re enumerable. Enumerable. Yeah, okay, I know what that. Exactly all the all the problems. Okay, so I know what recursively enumerable is. All right, so. Yeah, yeah. So the. the MIP story. Any recursively enumerable set can be distinguished by a, a reduction into a game. Maybe in terms of um, um, uh, Peter's question, why was this framed as a complexity class? Uh, yeah. Well, historically, it wasn't at all obvious that this would be such a powerful, uncomputable class. So because MIP, uh, the classical value is equal to next, which is a, you know, a completely decidable complexity class. And MIP star, until this result, most people probably thought that it was actually a decidable complexity class, meaning that until very recently, this would have been completely framed within the language of complexity and not uh, computability. But after this result, it became clear that no, this is actually a result about computability theory, but it was not at all obvious that it would be a priori, if that makes sense. It makes clear to me that this is a subtle issue. <laughs> Peter, Peter, I, I, explain I, I, it to me. Okay. Let, let me add. Uh, let me add the word. I mean that, that uh, Jad's uh, comment was very good. I mean, we're used to 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 this. You know, uh, two CNF is easy. Three CNF is hard. You, you make a variation on the same problem and the complexity jumps, but here it jumps in, in an unreasonable way, right? I mean, you take the same question in the classical realm and it's difficult, you know, it's next, but that's, that's very high in the hierarchy, but then you add the, the, the quantum aspect to this and, and all of a sudden it really <laughs> flies out of the, of the ceiling, right? I mean, it, becomes, uh, it includes all the undecidable questions. Yeah, so yeah, okay. That's pretty amazing. And there is some com uh, complexity theory here in the sense that the verifier, like the, the, the referee in the game must uh, be defined using an algorithm which uh, runs in polynomial time. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so there is some uh, complexity theory definitions inside MIP star to one. So um, I do have some restrictions on the referee, uh, how long can he calculate things and so on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it helps. I, my, my, I'm, getting, I'm getting a bit of a feel. Thanks. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I do where can you read about this? Where, where is there some uh, kind of uh, friendly introduction to this uh, underlying? I think there are very good uh, talks by uh, the, the authors of the paper uh, in the web, the YouTube channel of the Simons Institute in Berkeley. So I can okay. uh, just send them after the, uh, the okay, talk. Thanks. But I do wanted to say one last thing. My point is that even this modest uh, goal, just showing that succinct free coloring is inside MIP star to one, which is already known from 2012. If you can show it using a linear constraint system game, probably you can upgrade it to a proof that non-hyperlinear groups are uh, exist. Not are exist, just exist. So th this is a much more modest uh, goal, but uh, since uh, uh, Jean Atarajan, Vidik Wright and Yuan did all their work, potentially you can just use their methods and uh, replace everything. Like this uh, arithmetization trick from uh, MIP is equal to NEXP that I talked about the Babai, Fortno and Bloom thing. You can uh, replace it by some linear constraint system game and maybe uh, then enhance everything using their methods and uh, everything will fall in place. Uh, at least in my, with uh, parts of my talks with Vidic, uh, he said that uh, he believes that such a thing may, may happen. So uh, this is a good goal. 
thank you. Sorry for taking too much of your time. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, if not, Michael, uh, yeah. uh, Michael, you said that uh, there's particular parts of the MIT star equals RE proof that you think can be linearized and there's one particular part which can't. Um, uh, can you maybe say- Okay, so uh, I, about... I, 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 I uh, a bit uh, simplified it. Okay, so there is this all part of what they call question reduction. Hmm. So I'm, I'm working at, on it right now on understanding what is the group theoretic uh, uh, implications of linearizing this part, but it's, it seems quite easy to linearize it at least, to understand what, is, what are the implications on group theories maybe a bit harder, uh, or what, what happens in the groups there, with the groups there. Um, the answer reduction part co uh, contains a, a PCP theorem that includes as part of it, this arithmetization trick. And you can show, you can prove that classically you cannot linearize this arithmetization trick. So you must use some quantum ideas or some uh, things from group theory to actually linearize it. You, can, you need to find some uh, uh, other tool, some other gadget that replace this arithmetization trick uh, in the PCP theorem that they use. So it's the answer reduction, the PCP, which is like the snap. Yeah, the, the PCP part of the answer reduction, mm -hmm. the actual PCP that they use, uh, at least the, the, for sure there is no classical way of uh, linearizing mm -hmm. it. And the question, I think the interesting question is whether you can do it. And I think th this question already con contains the, the hard part. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, showing that uh, succinct three coloring is in what's called lean. Maybe I'll write it here. Oh, I didn't write anything. Lean MIP star, okay. Okay, it doesn't write, but you understand what I mean. Yeah, very good, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if no further question, let me just uh, thank uh, Michael once again for a very good uh, overview of this, this deep, deep subject and uh, Michael is running a seminar in Jerusalem, but nowadays it doesn't matter where is the seminar, uh, 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 you can join it, it will be renewed after Passover, like in two weeks from now, something like that. Next week we will turn to something which will be quite different than what we heard so far, it will be back stability, but in a Piadi context, uh, Francesco, I think you are with her, right? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, okay. So he, uh, Francesco developed a very interesting theory, kind of almost single-handed by himself, just uh, uh, where the target groups are periodic instead of unitary. And there is an uh, interesting uh, uh, similarity and, and even more interesting differences between this and the classical theory. So we will meet next week to hear Francesco. So that's all for today. Thank you all very much. And uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alex. Bye. Bye. Thank you for being here.